All right. Good to be with you this morning. We're going to do something we don't do every week, but based on uh, exactly what Heather said, I think this is an important moment. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to just stand up, turn somebody next to you, greet yourself to them, say hi, let them know you're here. There are a lot of new people here. Just say good morning. All right, all right. Y'all can have a seat. Seriously, you can have a seat. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Save it till later. It's my turn to talk. Uh, But Heather is absolutely right. It has been an incredible last month. I hope you feel the same uh, of just, yeah. You know, many of you, um, if you're new here and you're like, what are you talking about? Um, A neighboring church of ours, The Shelter, uh, recently closed down for very good reasons, and they've all decided to join us, uh, at least for a time. Yeah. And um, man, what a humbling experience this has been. It's been so cool to get to know so many of you, and I feel like there's already this spirit-led synergy among us that um, I couldn't have written if I tried to, and so I I just feel so grateful for that. But I have a new shirt on, and so I'm going to preach this morning, and uh, let's do it. When um, When I was a really young green pastor, I had this problem where I believed I knew all of the answers to all of the questions. Um, and I, I just had this arrogance about me, and it wasn't overt, but I had this arrogance, this bad attitude, because I just thought I knew better than everyone else. And that's a tough place to be. I was, I was filled with a lot of ideas, and a lot of them at the time flew in the face of what was happening at the church where I was serving. And so there was this one moment where I was sort of complaining about things, and I was, I was constantly just getting at the, you know, the, the heels of our senior pastor, like, why are we doing this? We should be doing that. And you know, he was so patient with me. But there was this one moment where we were having a one-on-one meeting and we were talking. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something. And he just quietly got up from his seat and he walked around behind me and he shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh no. <laughs> And he sat in front of me, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but he confronted me. He confronted me. He confronted my arrogance. He confronted my my bad attitude. I mean, he, he had seen enough. He had been patient enough. And even though I know in that moment he did not want to have to do that, he did it because it was necessary. And I will never, so long as I walk the face of this earth as a pastor, forget that moment because it was transformational for me. It showed me, number one, how much that pastor loved and cared for me, that that he wouldn't allow me to continue to walk through life, especially as a leader in the church that he was responsible for with this bad attitude and this arrogance. Number two, it showed that he wasn't willing to let the the church suffer because of my behavior. And number three, and maybe most importantly, in that moment, he knew the only way that I was going to experience change in my life was if he confronted me. Now, in short, this confrontation in his office 20-some years ago was really a moment of redemption for me. My arrogance and my attitude, it needed to be put to death in my life. And it really wouldn't only come until he confronted it for me. Now, it should be noted that the pastor that I'm talking about uh, is one of my 
mentors in life. He is one of the most mature, loving men I have ever met. And he has mentored me for decades. And because of that, he knew in that very moment what was needed. But I don't think that it made it any easier on him. I think it was really hard for him that day. Because here's the truth that we all know. Confrontation is no fun. Right? I've never been like gone into a moment where I'm like, I really need to speak truth into this person's life and I can't wait. <laughs> I mean, and if you have, like you are a special breed because confrontation is just not a whole lot of fun, but it is often necessary. And so as we dive into the book of Acts again, we are going to see this truth played out in a way that I think can help us when confrontation is needed in our lives as well. So with that in mind, if you haven't done so yet, grab the Bible app, open it up, go to events and follow along with our passage this morning. If you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now last week, uh, we took just a short break from the book of Acts. We got a special message from Pastor Joe, a killer message. Yes, it was. Yeah, Pastor Joe um, was amazing just talking about Lent and the season that we're in as we head toward Easter. And hopefully you've had time to think about that. But today we're going to jump back into the book of Acts. And we've been in this book since last January, and we're now just cracking into chapter 13. Believe it or not, uh, most scholars believe this is kind of the start of the second half of the book of Acts. Luke changes his tone, he switches gears a little bit, and he begins to focus on the three missionary journeys of Paul and a lot of the events that surrounded it. Now last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago, we were finishing up chapter 12. A lot happened in chapter 12, right? We, we, we learned about Herod Agrippa, this really horrible king who was after the, pleas, the, 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 so the praises of the people and he would do anything for it. He kills uh, two, uh, one of the leaders, James. He imprisons Peter, the leader among leaders in the early church. Uh, Peter has this miraculous break from prison, and he's on the run as a fugitive. And then at the end of chapter 12, we find out that Herod Agrippa, full of himself, uh, stands before some people, and he just presents himself as if he's a god. And man, he's just dead on the spot. And there really is sort of this hard left turn that Luke takes as he moves away from what's happening in Jerusalem in particular and Judea and into the more Roman Empire world that Paul is about to go on, which is where we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Luke writes this. He says, among the prophets and teachers of the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manaen, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Now Luke lets us in on some of the early practices of the church, especially among its leaders. Luke tells us that the men listed here of the church of Antioch of Syria are spending time together worshiping and fasting and praying. There was no manual for any of this, right? We, we have the benefit of having the Bible. Now we can look back and go, oh, maybe we should practice these things as well. The Spirit was leading them, working in them to lead them into these practices, of which, by the way, we're doing two of them this morning, worshiping and praying and fasting. Together, they were spending time honoring God and listening for His direction in their lives. And as they do, they get this impression, they're told, so to speak, by the Holy Spirit that Barnabas and Saul, who will later be named Paul, are going to go do a new work. Now, this seems exciting, right? Like, oh, this new thing that, that Paul and, and Barnabas go get to go do. But really, if you think about it, this would have been really difficult for them. These men have been worshiping and working together for years. Sending half of their group to do a new thing would have been really difficult to do. But of course... 
they're also not people that are going to stand in the way of whatever the Holy Spirit is up to. So verse 4, this is what Luke says. It says that so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit, right? They're not doing this on their own. They're not like, we need, we got to get out of here, right? We're sick and tired. They are led by the Holy Spirit to a new work. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and then they sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until they finally reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Well, there's nothing, look, there's nothing real specific indicating why Paul and Barnabas and John Mark go to Cyprus. Um, we do know in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, that Barnabas was actually from Cyprus. This was his home nation, his home area. He's from that area. And so I guess it's possible that they realize, like, look, maybe we should go to some place we're kind of familiar with. The Holy Spirit needs, seems to be leading us there. Let's go to Cyprus. And they have this intimate connection, I think, with that area. And one of them, at least, is familiar with the towns that are there or maybe some of the people that are there. And so it seems like a natural place for them to go. And eventually they move from town to town to town, Luke says, and they end up in Paphos in Cyprus. Nothing special about Paphos, except that as they're there, they meet this guy with a very precarious name, Bar Jesus. And this is what happens as they get to know him. Verse 7. Speaking of Bar Jesus, he says, he had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, Elymas and Bar-Jesus, same person, wasn't uncommon for somebody to have a Jewish name and also a Greek name. In fact, Paul would have that. He was Saul, that was his Jewish name. Paul was his Roman name. Right? We'll find out he's going to start being called Paul here, but it's likely that he had that name his entire life. And when he was with the Romans, he was referred to as Paul. When he was with his Jewish friends, he was referred to as Saul. So Bar-Jesus has the same thing going here. Elymas, the, the Greek name he has, it says that he interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Bar-Jesus, or Elymas here, is in this governor's back pocket, right? Like, he has been doing his sorcery and prophesying. Man, he has won the attention and the audience of the governor. And because of his sorcery, he has impressed him to the point that he has sort of a platform on which he's established himself within this city of Paphos. And so having this approval from the governor would have meant a lot to Bar-Jesus, it would mean money, it would mean influence in the area, it would mean fame among the people. So when Barnabas and Saul visit him and tell him about God's word, tell the governor about God's word, this bar Jesus is going to do everything in his power to make sure that the governor stops listening, right? I mean, what? Like, they are threatening his authority, his his influence in that area by what they're saying about this man named Jesus. Verse 9, Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. So Paul, Paul never minced words. And in the case of defending Jesus and the mission of God, he really didn't mince words. So there's this effort on his part to derail 
the conversation, I'm sorry, there's an effort on Bar Jesus' part to derail the conversation of Paul and Barnabas with this governor. And Bar Jesus, as a result, is confronted by Paul. Paul even refers to him as son of the devil, which is like, dude, that's a little much. But actually, this is a play on words because the name Bar Jesus actually means son of Jesus. And so, Paul is saying, you think you're the son of the one we talk about. Not so much. You're actually closer to becoming the son of the devil. And listen, everybody who's listening knows this. You can hear this collective like, ooh, like, right? Like, what's going to happen next, man? Like, get the boxing gloves out. Something's going to happen. I mean, Paul is letting Bar Jesus know you are not going to have the stand right now. And he confronts him. You see, this name that he has, of son of Jesus, probably was something that he came up with at some point. It's it's possible he was named that. But Jesus had become this this entity within the Jewish world that people could, could attach themselves to and use for their own benefit. So for him to walk around saying, I'm the son of Jesus, would have meant something to someone. And now Paul and Barnabas are there to to reveal his true character, which has nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. So Paul, a little snarky as he would be, calls him son of the devil. Now those, again, wouldn't be lost on those who are listening, especially the governor. Paul is making it very clear that whatever comes out of the mouth of bar Jesus is not from Jesus. He's far from him. But here's what makes me wonder when I read this passage. There's a lot happening here, but here's the question that comes to mind for me when I see the interaction between Paul and Bar Jesus. Why? Why does Paul decide to confront Bar Jesus instead of try to persuade Bar Jesus? Why does he choose to confront him here? Because here's the deal. I will admit that as a pastor, I much prefer persuasion over confrontation. And so do you. Because I've confronted some of you occasionally, and you don't seem to like it very much. (laughs) Right? Look, I'd rather have a conversation where I'm able to lay out the case of Jesus and his mission than get in someone's face and call them the son of the devil, which I would never do to you, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome, Jane. I would never do that to you. (laughs) And in addition, Paul doesn't use this sort of confrontation very much. It's not like Paul walks around from town to town doing this exact thing all of the time. More often, Paul actually chooses persuasion to gain people's favor and share the good news of Jesus. But there's something going on here that causes Paul, who, by the way, is filled with the Holy Spirit, to confront Bar-Jesus. Let's go back to the story real quick, because Paul and Barnabas have been called in by Sergius, the governor, because Sergius wants to hear about Jesus. He says, I've heard all this other stuff. This Bar-Jesus guy keeps telling me these things, but I've heard about you guys, and I want to hear what you have to say. Bar Jesus then interrupts and he urges the governor to pay no attention to the men behind the curtain, right? Pay no attention to these men. And then Luke records this at the end of verse 8. Bar Jesus, he's referring to, he says he was trying to keep the governor from believing. Something different that's going on here than that happens in other places. You see, Paul and Barnabas, they are on a mission. They're on a mission. They're on a mission of redemption and change in the world. Their goal is to help people experience the redeeming, transformational love of Jesus in their lives. And for them, they will not allow anything to get in the way of this happening. So when someone tries to intentionally stand in the way of accomplishing the mission they've been called to, they will often be forced to use confrontation. Which, by the way, this is nothing new in the Bible. This is a constant theme throughout the Bible. The Bible is ultimately the story of God redeeming creation, especially humanity. 
From the moment that sin enters the world in Genesis chapter 3, God is on a mission to redeem the world back to himself. And even though it's not wanted, God will often confront in an effort to bring redemption and change in the world. He'll use leaders like Moses and prophets like Jeremiah to bring about redemption and confront the people of God to do so. He'll even use punishment and discipline and exile to bring about the change and redemption he desires in the world and in his people. Even Jesus, even Jesus will often confront people and situations for the sake of redemption and change. Time and time again, right? Jesus comes face to face with the religious leaders of the first century in an effort to both change their hearts and to keep them from interfering with the mission that God has sent him on. And he doesn't mince words with them either. He calls them things like broods of vipers, right? Use that this weekend, your office place, and see how it goes. <laughs> right? That's a joke, by the way. Don't, my pastor told me I was supposed to say, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And all that said, here's the thing. This is hard, I think, for some of us to believe or come to terms with. But, but there's a purpose be, behind confrontation in the Bible. There's a purpose. And the confrontation of God throughout the Bible is an act of love. We, we are sinful human beings, and we need redemption. We need change desperately. We're stubborn and we're rebellious. We are unwilling to often listen to reason and truth. And well, sometimes the most effective way to bring about redemption and change in our lives is to confront what is needing redemption. You know, here's the thing. I think about that moment in the office of my former pastor. If in that moment, he would have tried to persuade me to, to take steps and maybe, you know, addressing some of the issues in my life. I don't think it would have been very effective. I know it wouldn't be a very effective because he'd been doing that for months. It wasn't until he confronted it that the Holy Spirit began to change something in me. And Paul's confrontation of Bar-Jesus is an act of love for the sake of redemption. Right? Paul's not just mad here. He's not just like, this guy, I can't stand him. I need to put him in his place. He has a purpose behind this. Paul is on a mission to help people like the governor enter into a new relationship with Jesus to experience redemption from sin in his life. And as such, Paul is not willing to let anyone or anything derail that process, even if it means he has to confront them and put himself on the line in the process. Now, I want to back up for a second, because before we go too down, far down the road of, like, we need to go out and start confronting people, which is not where I'm going with this, by the way. Did somebody say amen? All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. We, we should talk later. Yeah, you and I should talk. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Before we go down that road of just going out and start, you know, don't go to the OBH and start, ah, you know, don't do that. There's a key ingredient about Paul that I don't want us to miss. Because I do believe that we as Christians are called to confront the brokenness in this world. That we are called to bring about redemption and it often means that we have to stand face to face on the firm foundation of Jesus and say, that's wrong. There is a place for that. But it will only produce the godly Redemption we want if one ingredient is true of us, and it was true of Paul, and I don't want us to miss this here, okay? I don't want us to miss this. Because this confrontation on Paul's part, it's not coming from a place of bitterness or resentment on his part. The confrontation that he is bringing to Bar Jesus is being fueled by one thing, the spirit living inside him which is an essential piece to all of this because I want you to hear this. Only spirit-led confrontation produces change. It's the only kind that produces redemption and change. 
Can I tell you, wait, I can't. I can't tell you how many times I have confronted somebody simply because I was mad and bitter and resentful. And I would love to tell you that it went swimmingly, but it never did. Too many times to count. And you know what didn't happen in those moments? Redemption didn't happen. There was no change. Simply confronting someone because we're angry and bitter, it only causes more issues. You know what I'm talking about. Which is why before we go around confronting the world, you know, for Jesus, we need to go through the same process that Paul has gone through prior to this moment. Because here's the thing, I believe that God has called us to a mission to confront the injustices, to confront the brokenness, to confront the need for redemption in the world. We have been called to that, but we can't do it unless the Spirit is living in us. And we can't do it unless He's already done that work in us. I love that you guys love this. Because we're about to get dirty, right? Like, it's about to get really real right now. So you, I'm glad you think amen to that. Here's the thing. It's really easy. Our, our men's, I meet with a men's group on Saturday mornings, and uh, which, by the way, if you're a guy and you want to meet, we meet every other week at 8 o'clock right here. Love to have you there. And we've been going through the book of Jeremiah, and it's been amazing to, to walk through that with these guys. But sometimes we forget as we flip through the pages of Scripture, that there's a lot of time between one event and another, right? Like, you could read the book of Acts this afternoon, but that takes place over the course of, like, 40-some years, right? And so, at this moment, when we're reading about Paul, a lot has been going on in his life up until this point. In fact, it's been about 12 years since his conversion on the road to Damascus. Paul has been spending time in Tarsus and Arabia out of the public's eye for 12 years up until this point. And in those 12 years, the Holy Spirit has put him through the ringer. Because Jesus needed to deal with some stuff in Paul. Jesus had called Paul to be this this, this apostle to the Gentiles to go and to confront the world of its brokenness and sinfulness and to bring hope through the person of Jesus. But before he could do that, the spirit needed to do some work in him, some big time work. So he spent the past decade plus being confronted and redeemed and confronted and redeemed by the spirit. His life has drastically changed. Lest I remind you, Years prior, 12 years prior, he was killing Christians for their faith, and now he's going to places like Cyprus and confronting people that they don't know Jesus. A lot's happened in Paul's life, and the Spirit has had to call out the sin and the rebellion and the stubbornness of his own heart so that he could be led by the Spirit to confront the brokenness of the world. Look, if, if Paul would have had this conversation with Bar-Jesus, right after choosing to follow him, it would have been a disaster, a total disaster. The confrontation wouldn't have been done for the sake of redemption, but simply for the sake of being right, which I could preach a sermon on that one because oftentimes our desire to confront somebody isn't because we want to redeem something, and it's not because we want something for them. We just want to be right. Right? That's not what Paul's going for here. But had he done it 12 years earlier, it could have been a disaster. Paul needed shaping before he started confronting, which is exactly what Jesus means when he says these words. You're not going to like them, but you need them. He says in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 7, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. In other words, before we go confronting everyone else about the change that's needed in their life, which I believe we're called to, by the way, we got to first allow the Spirit to confront what needs redeeming and changing in our own. To be open to the Holy Spirit confronting the garbage 
that has taken up residence in my mind and my heart to allow him to confront us, hard though it may be, for the sake of our own redemption. I mean, I don't know a person in this world that doesn't want to see redemption and change among us. I see, you see, the injustices in our community, and I want to see redemption. I see the way in which people are being fed lies in our world, and and I want them to see the truth. I see the way in which Christians are grasping for things other than Jesus for the hope that they want, and I just want to see redemption in them. I see the next generation growing up in a world where they're taken advantage of and the church is doing little to provide a foundation for them, and I want to see redemption in that. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, or even if you're not a follower of Jesus, you, like Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, you have been sent to be the redemption in this world. You, not just me, not just pastor, but you, the priesthood of all believers, you've been called to lovingly confront the injustices and the inaccuracies around you while being led by the Spirit. I mean, we're not called to stand idly by and watch people be fed half-truths and others treated unjustly. We've been sent to bring hope and redemption to those very situations, and not out of bitterness and resentment, but out of a Spirit-led life. But here's the thing. If we're ever going to be those people on mission like Paul and Barnabas are, we need to start with our hands raised saying, I need redemption. We have to take a note from Paul and allow the Holy Spirit to do the dirty work of redeeming our own lives first. You know, maybe the most dangerous thing that can happen in a Christian's life is for them to start confronting the people and circumstances around them before allowing the Spirit to confront the very sin in their own lives. It's destructive. It's not redeeming. Because, I'll say it again, only Spirit-led confrontation produces change. And we cannot become Spirit-led until we allow Him to confront what needs redeeming in our own lives. That's where Jesus says to start. Stop focusing on the world and what needs redeeming when the Spirit has work to do in you first. We'll get to that. But let me work on you first. So this morning, here's what I'm asking you to do. I am asking you to allow yourself into a posture of utter humility. Just like when I was a young, green pastor with a bad attitude, I want you to allow the spirit to get up from his chair, to walk around you, and to close the door behind you this morning to allow him to expose and to confront the things in your life that are holding you back from experiencing the abundant life in Jesus and to becoming a source of redemption in the world. The world needs you. The world needs you. It needs redemption that Jesus, for whatever reason, said, it's going to come from you, church. But before we go out of this room and we leave, we we need the Spirit to confront what's going on in us so that we can do it with pure motives, so that we can be led by the Spirit to confront the injustices in this world. And it's only through that that it'll produce change. It's also very possible this morning that you're going, holy moly, this is all too real to me. And I want to invite you to just take a step of faith this morning to lean in a little bit. You realize there's redemption needed in your own life, in your own heart, in your own mind. And you know this morning that the only way that that can occur is through the Spirit of God working in your life through Jesus Christ. I promise you God is drawing near to you right now. He is inviting you into something new. He is calling you to just take a simple step towards him to allow him to change you from the inside out. And so I'm inviting you to just move towards him, to allow him to lovingly redeem you through his life, death, and resurrection. That all of us in this moment would just stand humbly before our creator and say, God, 
What needs redeeming in my life that I might be redeeming in the world? What needs changing in my life so that I might be an agent of change in the world? We have this saying here that we say, we want to be a community of changed lives, changing lives. Which means that we want to be a community of people that stand in this posture of humility and say, Jesus, what your will be done in my life. Expose the darkest places of my soul and change me that I might be an agent of change in this world. He said, there is nothing better in my mind than working side by side with the creator of the world to bring redemption into the broken places of this world. But it starts right now with us saying, God, have your way with me. Give me a clean heart. Deal with whatever's going on in my life. God, we come to you humbly this morning. We thank you for the the boldness of Paul, but we also, we thank you for the story of Paul that, that God, it, you had taken him so far from where he once was that you had brought about redemption and change in his life to the point that when he got to Cyprus, he was able to confront what needed to be confronted for the sake of the mission going forward. And on that day, Sergius Paulus would come to know you because of it. God, we want to be on mission like that. And so this morning, we invite you and your spirit to do a work in us, to expose those places in our lives that need redemption and forgiveness and healing, that we might confront lovingly the world that is desperate for redemption in itself. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus who came to this earth to confront the sin of this world, to walk perfectly among us, to teach us, to guide us, to give us an example, to willingly walk to a cross and die upon it so that we might be invited into a new relationship with you, experience redemption in our own life. God, that the sin that once held us would no longer keep us captive, but that we would experience the freedom of new life in him. We thank you that he resurrected three days later so that we have nothing to fear in this world, but that he is now still actively working in and through our lives. And so in this moment, in this very moment, may your spirit move through this room that as we sit humbly before you, that you would do a good work in us, that you would redeem us for the sake of redemption in this world. We thank you, Jesus, for the way that you love us for the way that you guide us, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.